It's a blessing to welcome on one of the top rising players in the Pac-12, had an incredible sophomore season for Washington State, Noah Williams. How you doing, man? Good. Yeah, how you doing? Pretty good. Well, kind of take us through this. Obviously, you had a massive jump from your freshman year to sophomore year, really established yourself as not just one of the key pieces to this future of the Cougars, but also the entire Pac-12. Kind of take us through this past season, what it was like? Uh, it was it was a journey. COVID season was definitely different, um, but we had a lot of time to put in work in the off season. Um, COVID actually was a blessing in disguise because, I mean, you just had nothing but time on your hands. So that's really where the development came. Um, we had a young team this year. So, I mean, when we got back to Pullman, we, we had a lot of time to get in the gym together, like other than like some other teams in the country didn't like really get to practice and stuff like that. But with the uh, Whitman County uh, protocols for COVID, we were actually able to get into the gym. So that actually helped us a lot and um, helped our development as a young team for sure. That's what a lot of basketball guys say, and that's a huge thing. Obviously, the pandemic is bad and all that, but when you take obviously look at the positives, it gave guys time to work, work on your craft, get better over the past six, seven months. What were the things you really keyed in on? Like, what was your main goal? Like, what did you want to improve on during that quarantine time? During quarantine, um, I was back in Seattle. I was working out with um, Paolo and uh, John Christophilus a lot. We were uh, mm-hmm. that's really what sharpened my game. We were playing a lot of one on ones um, in this place we called the Bat Cave, but. Um, I really just worked on like my my deep ball, like and just playing off the dribble, just you know, picking uh, pros' brains and how to make you know different moves. And when I get to the paint, you know, use up fakes and you still have pivots. You know, pivots work. Like I was watching Timmy Allen yesterday. He put somebody in. Uh, he put somebody in the blender. He footwork was amazing. Mm-hmm. Like just little things like that um, helps your game a lot. And that's what I uh, try to. That's what I try to improve on in the off season. It's just like picking up the little things, not really trying to make, like make, be not trying to be the superhero, but just trying to do the little things in the game, like just watching film and just seeing where to be, like where to, where to get to my spots and things like that. It's pretty much what I worked on the off season. Now we're getting into the season a lot more, a little bit, but I kind of want to go back. I want people to kind of learn your story a little bit and how you really became the guy you are. So you're obviously growing up there. You've been the hometown guy for your whole life. Kind of in high school though, you go to a school that's known for some talent Bishop O'Day, you really create your legacy there. So kind of take us to that freshman year. What was that like just getting adjusted to the high school scene? Freshman year, it was a long time ago, it feels like. Um, let me think about it. Freshman year, I came in, I came in not even knowing that I wanted to go to O'Day. So like my whole, fr- like the start of my freshman year, I was like, I was in the mental space where like, oh, I'm at an all boys school. Like I'm not really messing with the vibes here. <laughs> I, I had I had uh, thoughts of transferring and things like that, but like I eventually stuck it out. You know, I've, I've never been a quitter, so I, I just pushed through it. But basketball wise, freshman year, it was it was a journey. I mean, I had a lot of older guys on my team to look up to. I mean, they held me. I was the only freshman on the team, mm-hmm. um, but they they welcomed me with open arms. And Coach Kerr, I came in with a new coaching staff, so every every uh, new journey I started, I came in with a new coaching staff, coach Curry, who had a new coaching staff, coach Smith, new coaching staff. So it's just like, everything is just, everything is open at that point when you have a new coaching staff, like there's nobody that has solidified spots. So you just, just go in there and do your thing. And that's what I really went in. I went in there with that mindset that summer and was like, I'm gonna just, just be me, you know, I'm gonna just play and have fun, you know, and, and just hustle. Little things that get me on the, is what gets me on the court is my defense, you know, taking charges, just little things like that. It's not my offensive game. Like, if you really think about it, my energy comes from the defensive end. Mm-hmm. So that's what I learned my freshman year from in high school is that you don't have to make an impact on scoring or, you know, just doing everything on offense. You you can really impact the game on on the defense end or grabbing rebounds. My dad always tells me that if you're if you're not scoring, just you know, just be impactful some else way, like on the court. Some more. Let me ask you this though: when you're talking about going out as a freshman, what were your original expectations? Like, did you see yourself becoming a high level Division one player? I know you weren't necessarily the highest ranked guy coming out of high school, but still, obviously having a lot of Division one offers, the ability to stay home, go Washington State. Like, did you see yourself becoming that kind of player? Um. I mean, I always dreamt of it. I always had a dream of it for sure, but I didn't know. Honestly, to keep it honest, I didn't know if I wanted to play football or basketball in college. Um, mm-hmm. I, I hung up my shoes my literally my senior year summer, like coming into WSU. I, I could have played 
football or basketball at WSU. And they wanted me to play both, but I wasn't, I didn't want to do that. But um, so I didn't really know in my brain, like what I wanted to do, but I had, I had options, you know? Mm-hmm. So literally it was just, I left it up to God. I just let, let it up to God, kept it in God's hands and and he blessed me. Um, I mean, basketball has just been, I've been around basketball all my life and I knew that I could go D1, like for sure. My, my family, my whole family is D1 products. So mm-hmm. I knew it was destined for sure. Some way, somehow in any sport I was going to play, I, was, I knew I was going to go D1. Let's kind of jump in a little bit, but I want to touch up on that. You said, obviously, football was something you were heavily pursuing. Obviously, you're a great football career at wide receiver. Kind of get to that, though. Like, what led you to the difference? Like, how did basketball win you over? Why is that the sport you ultimately kind of fell in love with? I'm still in love with football. Don't get it wrong. I'd be watching the football games. I'd be out there at the football. I mean, last year, we was at the football games. I wanted to be – I was like, I want to be out there on the field. But, mm-hmm. but basketball is just – honestly, it was a business decision. Basketball is where the money's at. You know, my body, football, my body, I don't have the football body. So I was like, I can't be going up against these big, big fellas and taking these hits. Like, that's just not, that's not me. So um, honestly, it was a business decision. And basketball is, is the best decision for me. I mean, it's been, it's been doing well for me. Did you ever consider like going to sports? And if so, how far that discussion ever go? Like, was that ever something you legitimately were looking at or was it kind of briefly like, looking it over? No, I was, I couldn't. It's too much to do. Like, cause I, uh, Nate, I, I, would, I would talk to Nate Robbins. People back home knew like, mm-hmm. like that played football and did double sports. They said it was hard. Like you're missing, you're, you got, you got football practice all day. So you're missing basically the whole basketball, like all practice for basketball. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't come into the basketball season until like you probably missed like the first couple of games because the football season, you know, there's there's bowl games and things like that. So mm-hmm. that that put that that affects a lot. So I was I wasn't mentally or physically prepared to do that. Mm-hmm. And another aspect you talk about too is your family and your dad obviously kind of followed a lot of the same shoes you are. He's at, it was at Washington State for two years after starting off at San Francisco and obviously had a lot of records he put his name in. Kind of guess that's just him first of all. Like what was that just like kind of going to school he went to and Kind of continuing his legacy now. Um, I mean, it was it's a blessing. I didn't really, I didn't think I was going to come here at first. I mean, I wasn't going to come here at first when um, Ernie Kent was here. That um, I wasn't really getting recruited hard by that coaching staff. But um, everything happens for a reason. I was first committed to Buffalo, and the coaches left and went to Alabama. So I decommitted, and opened up my recruitment, and as soon as I opened up my recruitment, Coach Smith got the coaching job here. So. He, I remember him recruiting me at San Fran, so I just knew I had already had a connection with him. It's just, I mean, honestly, every like I said, everything happens for a reason. It was a blessing that that I was able to end up so close to home. That's a crazy thing because obviously a lot of people in the world somehow don't really realize how much talent is in Seattle, the Washington area as a whole, but really in that Seattle area, for whatever just- reason, like obviously as you said, the past coaching staff didn't want to recruit heavily in state for whatever reason they chose for that. Chris Smith comes in, obviously, he wants these guys, he wants you, he wants all these guys, and really wants to take advantage of the talent there. What's that like? I mean, the talent in Seattle is out the roof. Mm-hmm. Um, and people really don't give us our credit. They, de- they, I mean, people from California, they say New York's a big basketball state. They really disrespect Seattle. Like, mm-hmm. if you really think about it, we have so many pros that came out of Seattle and they still don't give us our credit. But it's like it's a blessing to be a part of the Seattle. Uh, they call it the home team family. That's what Seattle calls our basketball little community, home team family. So, um, I mean, you just – you got so many pros you could – brains you could pick. You got from Brandon Roy to Jamal Crawford, Isaiah Thomas. Mm-hmm. Like, everybody – and everybody's close with each other. Like, I literally just got back to Pullman like two days ago. And um, Isaiah Thomas invited me to um, – invited me to open runs when, in, out in Tacoma. And it's just like the world is so small because my coach Shaw, um, my coach on my team, he coached half of all these players that played in Seattle. So it's just like the connections you have, you don't you don't know who you could, you don't know who is around or who you like. You don't know who to know, like who you know that knows who that, that you could build relationships with. And kind of saying this whole thing, like, I think obviously Seattle area is probably one of the more underrated areas in the country. I think obviously when you look at states, maybe you have California, or Texas, because they're just so big and they have so much higher population. But when you talk about true cities, like what's the best cities in the country? Easily Seattle is in that discussion for the best one in the country. Like how special is it out there? Like how how elite is the Seattle area? I mean, it's very elite. I mean, you have 
But we have the best player in the country right now coming out of high school. In my eyes, I think he's the best player, Pablo Bencaro. Mm -hmm. But he's not even the only player that's, like, you know, top top coming out of Seattle. So, I mean, we have a lot of young talent. I mean, the young talent in Seattle is crazy. So, I mean, it's only only, only time will tell. We'll see what happens. Now, this is really jumping a little bit ahead, too, but there are two guys that we know are now available. One's looking at college originally trained for a year, Marjan. Another one that just plays the transfer portal, Tara Eason. I also talked to both of those guys, and they obviously have an idea of going to Washington State. That's someone they're going to consider. What would it be like to possibly learn those two guys? Man, our team would be – I think our team would – that would be – that would solidify our team for sure. That would be two key pieces that we would need. Let's just uh, hope that we get them. When you're talking to them or any kind of recruit, like what's your pitch? Why is Washington State the best place for a recruit to go to? Um. I would just say it's because the, the um, it's the easiest place to develop mentally and physically. Like you're, it's no distractions out here. Um, it's not like a, a huge city. Like I mean, the other people say it's a party, like a party school, but like it's really easy to lock in and focus while you're out here in Pullman because there's I swear there's nothing to do out here. So like it's literally nothing but just basketball, go home and relax. So, I mean, I, I would say, like, the de- developmental piece would be the, the biggest key I would, I would uh, preach to recruits. And then just the coaching staff. The coaching staff is just, I feel like, is one of the best coaching staffs in the country. They are um, really straightforward. They're, they're not, they're not going to tell you no lies. They're going to give you the real. They're not going to pitch to you that, uh, are you, oh, you're going to come in and, and start right away. No, it's not. It doesn't work like that. You know, it's like you got to actually earn your spot. So we got – that's what our summer workouts is for. We got hustle stats, and it just shows who who's the top of the hustle stats is going to play, and that's pretty much it. What it is, I wouldn't preach. I wouldn't preach anything. I wouldn't lie to him, saying all oh, like you're going to get everything. It's like the keys is yours. I wouldn't lie to him. I would just keep it straightforward with him. Let him know it's the best place to come and grind. I had Isaac Bontan a few months ago, and he talked about the hustle stats, and that's a huge thing. Where not I don't think too many programs do that, and that's a unique thing that. Really can obviously say who's the dog in the team, who wants to win games. What's that like? Kind of take us through the whole that whole system in the offseason and during the season. I mean, that it really like people think that like the offseason is like not like so much of a grind. That, that's really the hustle stats really is what makes practice so much fun. Like because everybody's competing to 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 be the king of the hustle stats. So it's like as everybody got high energy, everybody's playing their best. So it's like that's what makes everybody better is iron sharpens iron so when you're playing against other good talent and everybody's going their their hardest that's only going to make us better as a team you're talking about that seattle family and that's something that i've really noticed i think some people should really see is that overall like you said the, the grown-ups the guys that have gone back and played in the nba or even in there today really come back and really invest in the youth really help you guys develop work out with you guys train you guys and kind of be a role model to you guys how critical has it been for you and just all the other guys that's in high school and college? Like, how big is it to have guys like Isaiah Thomas, Jamal Crawford, all those guys be able to come back and help you guys? It's amazing. Um, it's like, like I said, it's a blessing. Um, mm-hmm. Jamal Crawford be having camps. He has camps that he uh, has for the high schoolers and for the young cats too. So, like, the camps will be like a lot of NBA workouts. We'll do an NBA combine. Then we'll do like film. We'll watch film. That's just like just getting us prepared for the next level as a high schooler and as middle schoolers. Like those, it's just the little things. Like they say, it's not, it's a, it's 90, 90, 99% mental, 1% physical in this game. So mm-hmm. it's just the little things that, that Jamal and the other, other cats do for us. Um, which, is, which is great for the, for the community. Both those two guys are guys that are really shown across the world as two of the better people that's played in the NBA before. Jamal Crawford, we know, has been one of the best teammates, best sportsmanship players, as well as obviously a great player too. But same thing as Isaiah Thomas. Have you guys learned how, – how have you kind of learned from those two guys? Like what's some of the stuff that they've taught you that you've kind of learned and applied, but not just on the court, but also off of it? Um, Jamal, for sure, um, I feel like he's the best role model to come from Seattle, like from backpack giveaways to, to turkey drives. I would say Jamal taught me a lot about just giving back to the community. Honestly, that's that's what like when I when I make it or I get big, that's what I want to do. I want to go back to West Seattle and and give back to my community. Without a doubt, let's kind of go back into the high school career a little bit. That freshman year, you end up going to the state championship. You guys lose there. What kind of trip that put your shoulder? Because we know what that what ends up happening your senior year then. But 
What was that freshman year like? Obviously, losing state championship. What kind of chip did that kind of put on your shoulder? It was a learning experience, honestly. Um, I don't know if it put a chip on my shoulder because I was still a freshman, mm-hmm. you know, so I was still going through growing pains. Like my dad says, the best thing about a freshman is you'll always be a sophomore. So um, I wouldn't say it put a chip on my shoulder then, but it was just a learning experience, knowing that you could get to the state tournament, knowing how it feels to play in the championship, the jitters that you have. You know, it's just little things like that. It wasn't, I mean, I would say the chip came on my shoulder probably my junior, junior, sophomore year when they started, like, junior year when I started, I lost a lot of offers. That's what happened. I lost a lot of offers. I had zero offers going in my senior year. And I had to, I had to get it out the mud. Honestly, I had to get out the mud. I came up with a Buffalo offer out of, out of nowhere. <laughs> Buffalo coach called me and came to my house the next, like, next, next day. So, I mean, everything happens for a reason. It was a blessing, but that's really what put my chip on my shoulder was me knowing that I was probably one of the best in the state, but people not thinking that I was one of the best in the state. And that sophomore year, as you, as you said, you kind of go out there, you guys lose a lot of veterans on the team prior to that. Not the best overall, you're 13 and eight. How did you think that year and how you kind of grew into yourself that sophomore year? We were terrible my sophomore year. Um, I think we lost my sophomore year. I think we lost the first round of the playoffs to Ballard. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's a no go losing to Ballard. So, I mean, for sophomore year, I mean, that was just like my first time actually being control of the team, not really in the full control of the team. Cause I had my brother X as a senior leader, mm-hmm. but like the ball being in my hand majority of the times, that was the first time me actually being like the playmaker and, and actually doing things like that. So I just had to, um, I had to embrace a new role and that's what, that's what I had to do. And then junior year, like I, I had the, I had everything. I had all the tools that I needed. We just cut, we just got cut short. We, we were one of the best teams in the state, actually, my junior year, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't beat all the teams besides Garfield. Mm-hmm. We were like the number one seed, but they put us against Garfield my fresh my, my junior year. I don't know why I did that, though. It was like two number one seeds playing each other in the first round of the state tournament. But, yeah, we we, we got uh, we got cut short that year, but we were definitely, my junior year, we were definitely a pretty good team. We had a lot of good pieces on our team that year. That was Paulo's freshman year. Mm-hmm. And we had some big bodies as well on that team. So we was definitely in the in the paint pounding. And when you get a guy like Paulo, we know, as you said, he's the number one player in the country right now for the class of 2021. And regardless of class, I think, too. But when you got him in as a freshman, what was your initial impression? Like, did you think he was going to become this domino guy? Do you think he's going to become the best player in the country? Like, how close did you think he would be that freshman year watching him? Oh, I knew Paulo was going to be one of the best. I've known Paulo since I was in first grade. Mm-hmm. We went to school together. We went to St. Therese together from elementary school, elementary school. So I know Paulo was a, a tremendous athlete. He's probably one of the best quarterbacks I've played with. He played on my my mm-hmm. state championship team as well for football. Um, he's he's an athlete. So, I mean, I knew that he had the potential. He was just always so big as a kid growing up. He was just always so big. And, like, I just knew that he was going to be a, a giant because, like, his head was so big that he never really fully grew into his head. And by his eighth grade year, he just sprouted with six, eight out of nowhere. And then like his freshman year, freshman year, uh, eighth grade year was really his first time playing with his, his six, nine body. He didn't really know how to play with it because he really grew up being a guard. Mm-hmm. So that's why it, it doesn't surprise me when I see all these videos of Apollo, like really breaking people down because he really grew up being a point guard, like one of the, a shooting guard point guard. So his handle is like, it's there, but Seeing Paulo's development, I knew he was going to be a great player just just because of his upside. I mean, I've seen him play all my like all my life, so I knew where his talent was. I like said he also was on the field as a quarterback, and he always talked about that. Once he ended up getting t- ended up tall enough, in six nine or six ten, wherever he's at, he kind of knew, okay, this probably isn't going to be my sport. Probably is not going to be too many six nine six ten quarterbacks out there. So he always makes the transition back to basketball, but when he was born on the field, though, like what was that like? Just catching passes from him and basically playing two sports together. It was dope. It was um, it was a connect. I mean, that was my first time playing with Paulo because mm-hmm. in football because we played on the same organization growing up for Rainer Ravens, but he was always on the younger team, so I never played with him. So um, just playing with 
it built our it built our bond for sure. Um, football, I feel like at all day football builds the the relationship between players. Like it really that's really what makes the brotherhood at at all day is I feel like the football team. I like, think you get really close with each other. But um yeah, Paulo, I mean, that just that was just a dope experience to have him on a, on, a, on my team as a football player and being on my basketball team. We came in football, we won state and then we came in the next day after winning state driving in the same um, same time going to, to tryouts for basketball literally the next day coach Kerr was like you guys won state who cares you know new <laughs> day new job and you guys do come together and obviously create a great dynamic doing that winning state championship your senior year but as you said you personally though you didn't have any offers you go down to zero Buffalo comes into play a little bit later but what was your original thoughts like how were you adjusting to having no offers like what was going through your mind at that point in time winning state tournament um being like, I was just trying to get everything I was trying to get for I was going to shoot my senior year I was shooting for Gatorade player of the year King five I was trying to be on the stars times I was I made that I was trying to be first team all metro I was just trying to do it all so so my name would be out there and people knew who I was I mean people already knew who I was but like so just to solidify things like oh I'm not no bum you know mm-hmm. so I was just trying to, I was trying to win everything. My senior year was kill everything that was in front of me. Absolutely. And then you get that obviously off from Buffalo, you know, committing there with Coach Oates, how we know now how great of a coach he is. But what was that decision? Like, what led to Buffalo? Why is it the school you wanted? Um, Because I would say just because they showed me so much love without even really, like, seeing me play. Like, they, they sent me – they, they heard from Stanford – Stanford had called him. They had seen Stanford had came to one of my games and seen me play at Ingram. And this was probably one of my worst games I played all year. And Stanford called the Buffalo coach and was like, yo, you need to get out this kid. He's from Seattle. His name is Noah. Mm-hmm. And literally they called me and they're like, yeah, I heard like, you know, we've seen your film or whatever, whatever. Like we want to come up there and we want to watch you play. We want to come and have a home visit. So I knew like, as soon as they said that, like this is my first conversation with the coach. Mm-hmm. As soon as he said that, I'm like, okay. So they definitely are like, you know, they, they're showing love, a lot of love for sure off rip. So I was like, I was just intrigued by that. And then I went out to, um, Buff- I went to Buffalo on a visit and I had the time of my life. Um, it just, they welcomed me with open arms. Everybody did like the whole Buffalo community. Um, like the basketball team was like, I knew they fit my playing style. Like when I was watching, I went to the game, they fit my playing style. It was just up and down, a lot of fast breaks. I was just thinking the whole time I was watching the game, I was like, man, they're really just playing like my rotary team. Mm-hmm. I could do that, like for sure. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely a reason why I committed. And then, like I said, it was one of my only offers at the time. So I wasn't going to just play around and have somebody like mm-hmm. take my offer, somebody commit in my position and just take my offer. And I have no offers on the table. I got to go Juco, do last chance you or something like that. I wasn't, so I was just like, I was playing my cards right. And I, I love the school, so I was like, I might as well. So I just committed on the visit right there at the dinner table. Obviously, God's got a different path for everyone. And we know Coach Oates, he's an incredible coach, whether that Alabama now. And obviously, you just had to decommit, as you said earlier, and you know, going to where you're at today, Washington State. Take us that process. That can be kind of stressful. You obviously find your school, you fall in love with eventually. Then everything kind of falls apart for you. How are you able to kind of readjust and find Washington State and that become the school you end up going to? Um. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through it. So what happened was Buffalo had lost in the NCAA tournament. The next day, Coach Oates gets a job at Alabama. And he calls me and was like, oh, I got the job at Alabama, whatever, whatever. But we have a lot of point guards over here, so I don't think it would be the best option for you to to come over here, like, honestly. So I was, I was him being honest with me. I appreciate Coach Oates for that. Mm-hmm. But um, So that same day, I opened up my recruitment. A few schools hit me, but – like Kansas State, Kansas State and Washington State was really the two main schools. Mm-hmm. And um, honestly, I hated the recruiting process. So when I was, when I decommitted, I it was really stressful. I mean, I had to go talk to, talk to my family about a lot of things. I mean, I had friends I went to go talk to. It was definitely stressful. I didn't want to go through the process again because like I said, I was down and out. I had zero offers. So I didn't know really like, you know, what schools at this point really is like interested in me now. But me committing to Buffalo and 
them going to the NCAA tournament and me de- decommitting from Buffalo actually put my name out there a lot, like, you know, boosting my boosting my name a little bit. So mm-hmm. college coaches knew, like, oh, who is this kid? You know, that was just committed to Buffalo. They was in the NCAA tournament two years in a row, you know, so it was just like that helped me a lot. So um, Kansas State, they came up here for a home visit, and it was cool. They, uh, they came and see me worked out, but they never seen me play before, so mm-hmm. – they offer me, but they never see me play bas- like a basketball game before. So, mm-hmm. I mean, they probably seen film, but like they never see me in person play a basketball game. Yeah. So they basically offered me off of a workout. And um, I mean, the coaches was cool and all, but I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like that was the best option for me. Like if I was going to go play basketball in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> I was like, I might as well just go play basketball in the middle of nowhere, like five hours, a five hour drive away from home. Like I'd just be, Mm-hmm. right down the street so and plus my dad went here so I was just like man I could just continue a legacy that my dad never really finished so That's absolutely just- well my last high school thing I do want to touch up on is as we said you win a state championship in basketball also get that one in football too out of those two though take us through both of them and ultimately which one was your favorite one of the two of them basketball for sure 100 percent uh, my senior year people my senior year we went into that in that that tournament the 11 seed mm-hmm. it was the, we was the last seed of the tournament or, or there may have been 12 teams, but there wasn't a 12 team. We was the last seed, the 11 seed. And we was so doubted that year. Like everybody just hated O'Day. Like all the group chats on social media, O'Day was like the most hated team in the, in the, in Washington, I feel like. And that one was really special because I played on a, a fractured ankle that, that, that playoffs, like I, I got hurt the first game of playoffs, didn't play the, the whole Metro tournament districts. I didn't play none of that until, until the play-in game for the Tacoma Dome. Mm-hmm. So it was, a, it was a special moment. I was playing on a bump ankle and just knowing that I, I could push through that pain and, and go win a state championship with my brothers, was it was this amazing feeling. It was a dream come true. It's like freshman year, I was there, I lost. Mm-hmm. And I, I went out my senior year with the, the with a bang, you know, it was the best feeling ever, honestly. Well, I would say football was wasn't I wasn't so like I wouldn't say football was like the best because I didn't touch the ball in the state championship mm-hmm. for football. So but it was a great experience for sure. But we we oh day's a, a huge running team and I would love to touch the ball in the state championship. Well, let's head into that college career now. You go with Coach Smith, and this is, as you said, his first year out there. You're one of his first commits to play with him. How did he sell you? Like, what was his bond like? What was his pitch to you? Like, just talk about how your guys' bond first started and how it's grown out today. Um, faith, family, team, academics. That's what he That's what he sold to me. Um, I came on my visit. He was like, I mean, as a freshman, we want you to be – we want you to just focus on faith, family, team, and academics in, in your social life. You don't have to be – like I said earlier in the, um, in the in the video, I said um, you don't have to be a hero. So you don't have to be a hero coming in here. Just just have fun. You know, you're a freshman. Just you have growing pains that you're gonna go through. So just just take this as a blessing in a year to to learn and grow. And that's what I did. I got my opportunity and I took advantage of it. I think all Pac-12 players can have something to say right now because the whole country, pretty much all the national media. Obviously, it's a clear cut who they all viewed as the worst conference of the Power Five as the Pac-12 for a long time now. We see what they're doing, everyone's doing right now, all undefeated except for Colorado right now, all in the Sweet 16. How much was the Pac-12? I mean, just What's it like just seeing everyone be successful, kind of showing that? Obviously, you guys are one of, if not the best conference in America this year. It's, it's dope. It's dope to see. Every time I get on March Madness, I mean, I'm definitely rooting for all the Pac-12 teams. Like It's, mm-hmm. it's amazing to see them just smacking on all these teams. <laughs> Oregon smack. Iowa yesterday, USC just smacked on Kansas. So it's like when you hear these, like when you hear Kansas, you automatically think, oh, like that's like one of the best teams in the country off rip. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't get the respect over here on the West Coast. Like we really should, I feel like. But it's, it's dope to see for sure. And, it's, and it's, it's a blessing to be in this conference, conference of champions. That's what they say. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's head into that freshman year because you guys have a pretty solid team. You guys are under over 500 right about 16 and 16 last year. Could have had a chance to go in the tournament. Obviously, everything got shut down at the Pac-12 tournament because of COVID. But kind of just that freshman year, like how did you get adjusted to playing college basketball? Um, I would say making mistakes. 
making a lot of making a lot of freshman mistakes just on and off the court um helped me mature as as a person mentally and physically so like I would just say um yeah it's pretty just making mistakes honestly learning from your mistakes you got a couple guys on that team that are really veteran leaders obviously Isaac Bontown was a guy for junior year and you have CJ there as well what was it like learning from those two veterans those two guys oh it's, it's a it's a great they're they're great um it just taught me a a lot about work work ethic you know waking up CJ taught me a lot about waking up early mornings and going to grind me and CJ used to work out almost every morning at like eight o'clock seven sometimes seven o'clock is going to get shots up so I mean they just taught me about the work ethic and, and what it what it takes to to get to the next level CJ we know as an NBA player those guys are obviously work harder than a lot of people even realize how what was some of the biggest things you just kind of learned from him off the court though like just learning how to he conduct himself like what were some of the things you took away from him that way um, the way CJ just carries himself, he's, he just carries himself as a pro. Everything he does, the way from his diet, the way he, he works out, he gets up and just goes and runs the track. It's just little things that, that, that professionals do that, that I picked up on from CJ for sure. It's, it's dope. It's a blessing. You end up starting 13 games that year. When would you say it kind of clicked for you, though? When would you start saying that you finally settled down? You said, okay, I'm comfortable now. I can start playing. I'm a starter for this team. Like, when things started really kind of coming together for you? The first game I started against Oregon. I mean, I just, when I, just, I had the chance, I gave the coach gave me my opportunity, and I knew I had to make the best of it. I mean, I can't go out there making too many mistakes because I'd probably have – probably go sit back down next to him. So I knew that my leash was small, but I had to do it the best what I, you know, I had to do the best I can with my opportunity that I had. Your season high was 17. I came in a special game with Clay Thompson, gets his jersey retired and in front of a ton of people. What was that game like to taste that night? The atmosphere was amazing that game. Um, mm -hmm. It was just dope to have Clay coming into our practice from before, like before the games coming in and talk to us. Curry was at our games. It was just like the, the atmosphere just brought so much energy to the team. It was just like we was we was destined to win that game. It was destined to be a great game for everybody. IB had what thirty four that game. CJ had a great game that game. It was just like we was invincible that day. So now it's end of your sophomore year, and this is the year that really you take over because we know CJ obviously moves on. He's at Portland now, and it really becomes you and Isaac as the two main guys, the whole bunch of freshmen and other guys too. But kind of guess what your expectations were for the season. Like, how did you expect to come in and put up fourteen? Like, what was your expectation for the year originally? Um, just be the best me, mm -hmm. honestly. I knew what I worked on all summer, just coming in and just applying that to the game. Uh, I was just, yeah, just being the best me. Throughout the year, you have 14 points per game, four rebounds, three assists, two steals. What's the next jump for you? We know that you saw your big jump. You almost doubled all your stats from last year, freshman season. What's the next jump? Like, what can we expect for you now in your junior year? Um... You gotta wait and see. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to speak nothing. I don't want to speak on nothing. I just gotta wait and see. Over the course of last year, there was a whole lot of big games for you. Two of which were led to being Player of the Week by pretty much everyone in the country. Thirty-two point game, then a forty-point game against Stanford. What was that little run like? Um, I felt like. Who do I feel like? I felt like Dame Lillard. <laughs> you know, just I just had the hot hand and I was letting it fly. It was. I told myself at the beginning of the week, honestly, I told my girlfriend, I was like, I'm going for player of the week this week. And, mm -hmm. and I just spoke it into existence. When you find out you get the Oscar Robinson player of the week and a Pac-12 player of the week, all that kind of stuff, what went through your mind? Um, I was, I was shocked. I was honestly, I was just shocked. I was lost for words. I was, it was, it was, I was just too happy to really even say anything. I was just, it was just a blessing, honestly. I was just happy. That 40-point game is obviously huge, and we know your dad has the third highest ever, 43. Do you think something you can eventually pass? Do you think you'll be able to get over 43 eventually? Um, yeah, but my dad always tells me, he says, next time somebody asks you about my 43 or, or against your 40, just tell him that he's never scored 40 in a Pac-12 game. So <laughs> I got to say that he scored 43 against – I think it was Idaho State. Mm -hmm. 
That's what he wanted me to tell you guys is he ain't never scored 40 in a Pac-12 game. Without a doubt. Well, we'll talk about a lot of the big things, and obviously the big game for you guys every year is the hometown rivalry game against Washington. In that game, you have 21.6 rebounds. At Washington, you guys pull off the win. What was that night like? Um, That night was my birthday, so it was lit all night. It was <laughs> It was how I was turned up the whole day and I wasn't going to lose in Seattle on my birthday. So, I mean, it was, it was dope. It was fun. It was really fun. It was a funny moment. Something came up a little bit ago with a storyline. We saw that a fan off the ruptures Achilles during the game when you started bringing against the Stanford game. Oh yeah. That story and like what your reaction was when you heard that. That was crazy. I thought, I was I saw that on Twitter. It popped up on my Twitter timeline. I don't even really check tweets like that. So I was just scrolling through Twitter and I seen he had tagged me and I was like, like oh man, that's that's crazy. But it's that's it's funny at the same time. But you know, it's like, man, you really got so much energy. It's it's dope to see that the the Cougar fan base is just it's it's, it's so it shows so much love to our to our team and to the Cougar community. I'm extremely high in guys' 2020 recruiting class. I think coach nailed that one with that. You just had a whole bunch of guys that are heavily in the rotation and helped you guys win games this past year. How special was that 2020 recruiting class? I mean, in my eyes, I feel like they're one of the top 10 recruiting, you know, top five recruiting classes that came in. They're, mm-hmm. they're really young, but we're really good. Like, in their upside is tremendous. FA's upside, Deshaun, Andre, TJ. I mean, we can go down the line. Everybody's upside on our team is is crazy. So, I mean, if they put in that work, that they're, I mean, Lord knows what could happen for them. Absolutely. Well, a few more things before I let you go. One thing is you also have the nickname Slim. Take us through how that came to be and how you got the nickname. <laughs> um, it's just I don't know. I just grew up with that name. Honestly, just being being slim, skinny, not too not too buff, not too <laughs> too fat, just slim. For sure. And one thing I was like to wrap it up discussing a legacy. I think that all guys want to create something that they're remembered for. So by the time you do step away from the game someday, what do you ultimately want to remember for for what you achieve both on and off the court? What do I want to be remembered for? Um, off the court, I want to be remembered for somebody who always gives back, you know, somebody who's, who's genuine, who's a genuine person, you know, um, kind, just someone who's just, accepts people with open arms you know it's pretty much that's what I want to be remembered as is off the court as far as being remembered as on the court I feel like that's a good question I want to be remembered as a winner that's what I want to be remembered as a winner and I know also being a believer I can talk about faith a little bit how has God helped get you to the point you're at today um God has been in my life from for since I came into this world, and um, He's blessed me with many gifts, my athletic abilities. Um, it's just, I mean, I, I thank Him every day. I get on my knees and I pray. I thank Him before games. I tap to the tap my chest and I, to the sky, and I, I I thank Him when I make free throws. It's just giving thanks back to God. I mean, it's huge. I mean, He definitely is the biggest person in my life for sure. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Is there a moment you've seen God show up the most in your life so far, or a specific kind of moment you remember him showing up in your life? Definitely. Um, there was one time, so um, back in high school, my freshman year, mm-hmm. my uh, one of my good friends had passed away on this hill that is right behind my house. And, um, and he, he had died from a high speed chase. And one day I was going up that hill and it was raining. It was raining crazy. And I was just turning and my car had spun out. And I'm driving while I'm spinning out. I'm going up the hill. A car's coming down like 60 miles per hour straight towards me. Don't even see me. But I, my car just spun out the way like as soon as he just drove past me. So I'd, be, I'd probably say that's the, the moment I seen God and the moment I seen Kenny's angel that saved me for sure. That's That same day I could have no longer been here. That's awesome. My final thing for you, give Washington State fans your three biggest goals you have set for the remainder of your career. NCAA tournament, Pac-12 championship, 
And what's one more? Defensive player of the year. Absolutely, man. Well, definitely yeah. appreciate you taking time to come on today. And I can't see what I got next for you, man. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Of course. Come on, man. God bless. God bless. Stay safe.